Man, such a sad story. We get some insight into the mind of somebody burning in hell. That's what I want to talk about this morning. The title of my sermon is The Truth About Hell. I figured it is a hot weekend, and I knew it was going to be a hot hole. So why not talk about something even hotter than that, and that is hell. First point, I've got seven things I want to talk about hell today. I'll try and get through them as quick as I can. The first one is hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. And hell is such a terrible place that people don't want it to exist. You know, this is why people get it out of their mind. They want to think about, they don't think a loving God would even create a place so terrible. But we know, we know hell is a real place. And we know God is so holy. That's why hell is so hot. But it is a place, it is a real place of fire. Hell is not figurative. Hell is not just you're away from God and it's just the, the yearning to be with God and that's the burning you feel. No, it is a literal, conscious place of punishment. It is a terrible place. And this is what, one reason why, what, what should drive us to want to get people saved. Because it is a real place. Sometimes people live the Christian life as though hell is not a real place. They believe it's real, but they don't live like it is real. Because you know what? If you could spend a little moment in hell, you know what you would be thinking? You would be like that rich man, right? And we're going to look in Luke 16. There was a certain rich man. We'll go, oh, I won't go over it all for sake of time, but we see here the story is obviously a rich man and a beggar. Now, obviously you have, doesn't mean all rich people go to hell. Doesn't mean all beggars go to heaven. But we see here the fact that somebody who had it good in life is not saved, he's not going to have it good in the afterlife if he's not saved. And likewise, somebody who didn't have it good in his life, if he is saved, he will be comforted, right? He will be in heaven. Now, a couple of things that we can learn here is you notice that as soon as the rich man dies, there's no purgatory, there's no second chance, there's no, hey, hey when I meet God, I'm going to be able to, to, you know, talk it out with the big man and I'm sure I can change his mind. No. See, because the problem is, see, when you're a sinner and you die, you are already condemned. Right? It's not like you get a chance to justify yourself and stand on the day of judgment. When an unbeliever stands at the white throne judgment later on after spending you know, possibly a minimum of a thousand years in hell, he's not standing there to try and talk his way out of, out of hell. That's what they try. That's why they say, Lord, Lord! You know, and they're trying to call out that now they're trying to get saved. No, they're just being resurrected to be judged according to their works. They're already condemned, right? And this is now just the level, maybe the, the temperature of hell that they're going to spend for all eternity. So notice, when the rich man dies, the rich man also died and was buried. And look at this. This is a... This is a I, I, I've always noticed these in the King James Bible, right? And I just thought, oh, maybe it's not, there's no difference what these things are, but... And sometimes at the end of a sentence when it's a bracket, I always sometimes joke, oh, look, there's smileys in the Bible, you know, dot, dot, smiley, and dot. There's a wink in the Bible. If you didn't know, I, I just looked this up, because, you know, I mean, nowadays we don't really learn, we don't really use this sort of um, uh, formatting in our day-to-day -day writing. But, you know, semicolon, obviously, the, the, uh, sorry, the colon, the dot, dot, can be used to write a list, a list of things. This dot, comma, it's like, it's like a bigger pause than a comma, but it's still continuing the sentence. So rather than having a comma and just having this huge sentence, comma after comma after comma, if the thought is slightly different or there's a more of a pause, you use the semicolon, but it's still a, a, a one long sentence. That's why sometimes you're reading in the Bible, you just see you read, there's a comma, you read, there's a semicolon, and it keeps going, keeps going, because in the original language, it is just one big long sentence. But you know, because it's a semicolon, that the next sentence is going to be related to the previous one. And then a semicolon is like a list, but then when it's a full stop, you know it's like the end of the thought. Right? So that's why there's that sort of semicolon. Anyways, it's a comma, so it continues. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. So notice there, when somebody dies as an unbeliever, you don't just soul sleep, 
You know, there's not a second chance where you stand before God and you get to bargain your way out of hell. You die, you open your eyes, and you're burning in hell. Right? That's what happens. That's what we see here. Now, some people, like I said, they don't want to believe hell is real. They try and explain away hell. Right? They try and explain. They, don't want to, they want to put it out of their mind. They even try and explain away this passage. And rather, you know, we know that this is a story of two real people, but it's a rich man, and we're given the name of Lazarus. But some people, to try and explain away this verse, they'll say, you know what, well, this is not a real story. This is just a parable. They say it's just a parable about somebody burning in a fire somewhere, but then it's just the real hell is either like destruction or it's like, you know, just the burning of being separated from God. Now, this is what I find funny about trying to explain this away as a parable. Think about what a parable is. A parable is when you take something real, like a farmer or, you know, harvesting something, and then it's likened unto something spiritual. So notice that the parable is something that does exist, right? It is in the real world, and it is used to explain something of a spiritual truth, something you may not see yet. So if this is a parable, then that means hell also exists, right? Because if the parable is using hell, then, then it must exist because it can't be a parable to explain something else if what is in the parable doesn't exist. I hope that makes sense. So a lot of people try and explain that away by saying, hey, well, if it's only a parable, why is a fictional place that doesn't exist being used to describe a spiritual truth? And the other thing is, you know, people scoff at the idea of hell. You know, have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, I want to go to hell because all my friends are going to be there. Well, I want to go to hell because I'm sure the party down there is going to be great. You know, all the, all the rock stars, everything's going to be down there. But you know what? They can scoff all they want because we have insight into somebody that's actually there. They weren't, they weren't talking about how fun it was. They weren't talking about all the booze that was down there and all the chicks and all, all, everyone, all my mates are going to be down there. When he opened his eyes, besides realizing that he was in torment and asking to get some water on his tongue, what was what he thought of? He said, For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, look at this, lest they also come into this place of torment. So when somebody goes to hell, their thought is not, it's great down here. Their thought is, I don't want anybody else to come here. Send somebody to go tell them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. What is he saying to them? He's saying the Bible is enough to convince somebody. Right? The word of God is enough to convince somebody to not come to hell. And this is the sad thing, right? He says, hey, well, nay, Father, but if somebody went from them from the dead, they will repent. Hey, no, he says, if somebody comes back from the dead to tell them about hell, to tell them the truth, they'll repent. And this is a sad truth, right? If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you think, oh, man, surely if somebody came back from the dead to tell them about these things, they would believe? But they don't. Because you know what the funny thing is? Somebody did come back from the dead. <laughs> Am I right? Jesus did descend into hell. He rose back from the dead and people still don't believe him. Right? So that's why. This is a, this is a truth that we learn in Luke 16. So that's not what the rich man thought. Mark 9. Look at what Jesus says here. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Man, what imagery here. I mean, to, to cut off a hand, I mean, unless that, that knife is really sharp, even with a really sharp knife, to cut off the hand of somebody, I mean, that's, that's, that's a really, I mean, as a punishment, that's already pretty bad. To cut your own hand off. And you know, whenever I think of these verses, I always think of that movie Saw. You know, like, right? he's like stuck in the room. And he like, had to cut his leg off. It's like, oh. But this is what Jesus, Jesus is saying, hey, it's better for you to do that to yourself rather than go to hell. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. 
where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, obviously, Jesus is not saying here you have to cut your hand off and cut your foot off to go to heaven. What he's saying here is it is better if that's what's stopping you from going to heaven, if that's what's causing you to go to hell, you'd rather lose it than go to hell. Right? But obviously we know you just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to go to heaven. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. See, when we think of the word pluck, we think of like plucking a rose, like off the plant. You, know, you think of something delicate. Can you imagine having to rip your own eye out of its socket? But Jesus say, hey, it's better for you to literally stick your fingers into your eye socket and rip it out than to go to hell with both your eyes. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes, to be cast into hellfire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now let me ask you, if hell was not a real place, do you think Jesus would say this? Why would Jesus say, hey, it's better for you to cut your hand off, to cut your foot off, to rip your own eye out, rather than go to hell, if hell wasn't even real? If it wasn't even a place where people ended up? If you just died and ceased to exist, there was no punishment. It's because it's real, guys. It is a real place. And although you can't see it yet, this is why you have to walk in your Christian life by faith, because you have to realize these things are real in the Bible and you have to change the way you live accordingly. I was speaking to a guy at work recently. I was speaking about religion and stuff. He told me he was an, an apatheist. Apatheist. I was like, what is that? Is that like when you just don't care about God? You're apathetic about deism? Um, but apatheist is when you, you're, you're not an agnostic. So it's not in the sense that you don't know. You believe, you believe it's like irrelevant. It's like even if there is a God or isn't, it doesn't make a difference to my life, right? So we were kind of talking about that, like, yeah, of course what you, I, I was making the case, well, of course what you believe is going to change how you live, right? It's going to have some real effects in the real, so they think it's just irrelevant, like, because they think, well, whether you're religious or not, that's going to change working and live, but obviously that's false, right? Because it's going to change how you raise your kids. It's going to change how you live. It's going to change how laws are made based on what you believe about morality and stuff. So it makes a huge difference what you believe to real life. But sometimes we live knowing these things and it doesn't change the way we live. It ought to. Hell is real. Second one is hell is eternal. So hell is not a temporary chastisement or it's not a temporary cleansing. Right? Some religions, like Islam, for example, believe hell is like a chastisement where you go there, you get punished a bit for your sins, and then you get out. Right? That's why they always say things like, well, why should somebody else go to hell for you? They'll say, like, why shouldn't you go there for yourself? Well, it's because they think you can get out. Right? What they have to realize is in the Bible, you don't get out. Once you go there, it's a death sentence. You're there forever. So you can't just go to hell and get out. If you're there, that's it. So that's why you have to believe on Jesus. You have to stop yourself from going there. That's what we're being saved from. We don't go there like a purgatory either, like the Catholics teach or the Orthodox. You go there to be cleansed of your sins and then get out. Hell is not a place of cleansing, right? Hell is a place of punishment. It is the spiritual death sentence, right? And it's eternal. We'll see a couple of verses here to show people going to hell and they're still there. Right? It's not something that they just disappear from. Revelation 19. This is, I think, the best evidence of it. The beast was taken. So this is a man, if you know in Revelation, and the false prophet. So the beast is the one that is pretending to be like Jesus in the end times. The false prophet is the one pretending to be John the Baptist, right? The one coming before Jesus, pointing the way. So you see there in the end times, they're, they're going to use passages like, my messenger is going to come before you but they're going to pretend to be Jesus and the prophet coming before, right? And which he deceived them that have received the mark of the beast, them that worshipped his image. So this is where the beast and the false prophet are judged. Then these, the beast and the false prophet, so remember, these are two men, right? The end times. Were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So not just their spirit was thrown there, alive, their body thrown into the lake of fire. Now we go into Revelation 20, we see here after the thousand year reign, so the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire before the thousand year reign, 
Satan is bound for a thousand years while we're ruling and reigning on this earth for a thousand years. Now that thousand years expires, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, together, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is of, as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. So this is like this last charge to try and take over, right? And compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I always find that funny that they, you know, a thousand years this rebellion has been building up, and then Satan comes out and there's this charge, and then they're just all burnt, <laughs> gone. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brim brimstone. Look at this. Where the beast and the false prophet are, they're still there, burning in torment and shall be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Matthew 25. This is the judgment, the white throne judgment of the sheep and the goats. So we see the separation here, and then I'm just showing you this last verse in verse 46. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. Those are the ones on the left, right? But the righteous into life eternal. So notice that the punishment is everlasting. It's not a temporary punishment. Daniel 12, this is an Old Testament prophecy of the white throne judgment. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So notice that everlasting life is also somewhere we will be physically, right? And it lasts forever consciously. Everlasting death is the same, everlasting contempt. Luke 16, and this is, this is probably, you know, the passage, but people have ways to explain these away, so I'll just explain them to you. So we can see here that when the rich man went to hell, he wasn't, like, annihilated, was he? But he's in hell, and he's there. Because some people believe a doctrine called annihilation, where when you're thrown into the lake of fire, you, you cease to exist, right? So it's not that you're there consciously being tormented forever and ever, it's like you're thrown into the lake of fire and then you just black out. You're gone. You cease to exist. That's what they call annihilation. So we can see from the Bible, and I already showed you a couple of verses, that people are not annihilated when they're in hell. We see the rich man also, when he goes to hell, he's not annihilated. Right? He's there. But one way they'll try and explain this passage away is they'll say, well, annihilation happens when hell is cast into the lake of fire. So he's burning in hell now, and then when he's thrown into the lake of fire later, he'll be annihilated. So that's how they kind of explain it away. So it's not as strong an argument, but we can see here that when he's in hell, he's not annihilated, he's there. He can, he can feel it. And the last one is 2 Thessalonians 1, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. So the way I think it's right to understand that is you are, like we said, the everlasting death, everlasting contempt, everlasting punishment, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. But the, the annihilationists will say, ah, see, you, it's not that the punishment is everlasting, it's that you are destroyed everlasting, right? Like the destruction, the annihilation is forever. You will never come back, basically. That's how they try and explain that. But that is a verse that we would point to to show hell is everlasting, but they have their kind of ways around it. All right, so that's hell is eternal. Number three is an eternity in hell is a just punishment for sin. It's a fair punishment for sin. And this is something that a lot of people struggle with. And honestly, I struggle with it myself in the sense that, man, that is, you kind of think in your own reasoning in the flesh, you think, Surely one sin does not warrant an eternity of hell. But you know, when you make a statement like that, you know what you're assuming? You are assuming that God is unjust. And is that true? No. So when we say things like that, we're thinking, well, <laughs> surely God's got it wrong, right? And you know somebody else who had that thought as well? Is Abraham. So you remember in Genesis, when God was going to go visit Sodom and Gomorrah, because that place was overtaken with homosexuality, all sorts of sins. God was going to go destroy it. Right? And remember what Abraham said to him, bargaining with him? Look at what it says here in verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, 
That be far from thee. Look at what he says to God. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So when people say things like, ah, oh, that person wasn't so bad, well, this isn't so bad, why should they spend an eternity of hell? That's what you're saying. You're saying like to God, be it far from thee. There's people, is that saying to God, you're putting people in hell that don't deserve to be there. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know what the answer to that question is? Yes, the judge of all the earth will do right. And that's why in this picture, he saved those that were saved. He took them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But you know what? Everybody else that was not saved, who rejected the grace, boom. Fire and brimstone came down. And it's the same with hell. The judge of all the earth will do right because, you see, we make light of sin. We think one lie, that's enough to spend an eternity in hell? Yes. Because that's how bad it is in the eyes of a holy God. We in the flesh make light of it. We don't realize how sinful we are. Yeah, you think you come to church, maybe you serve God a bit, you think you got it all together. No. If you reflect on our sinfulness, we are wretched creatures. But by the grace of God, are we able to do anything pleasing to God? That's why it's without faith, it's impossible to please Him. All right? So hell, an eternity of hell, is a just punishment because God is just. So hell and the eternality of hell and the severity of hell ought to teach us something about sin, about what God thinks of our sin. So when we make light of it, we need to reset our expectations. Deuteronomy 4, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So God is saying here, if you keep God's commandments and his judgments, then you'll be a wise and understanding nation. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes, look at this, and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Revelation 16. I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, because, uh, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus, and, and, uh, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. So we ought never doubt the righteousness of God. We ought not doubt that God is fair. We ought to learn from God's revelation and say, Wow, if God treats it that way, let's try and understand why it's so severe. One thought I have had, and I'll share this with you, is because I often think, like, why, why is God eternal? Like, I mean, no, why is God? Why is hell eternal? Like, why did God choose a punishment that lasts forever, as opposed to, like, the position of the annihilist that believes, hey, well, once you go to lake of fire, it's done, it's gone, you, you cease to exist. And I think I, and the reason why I think is this, it's almost like God gives people what they want. He gives people what they deserve. They also give people what they want. And think about salvation, right? Salvation is, Romans 8, look at this. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So think about what saves us. What saves us is we hope in something. Now, if hell ended, there would be something to hope for, that one day it would be over, one day you would be gone. And it's almost like hell is eternal because hope itself is removed. Right? So it's, like, it's almost like God saying, you reject the grace, you reject the hope. Now hope is removed as well. That's one thought there anyway. Hell is eternal. Number four is hell is God's righteous judgment. It is not Satan's headquarters. 
right? Some people think Satan is down there, like the, like the yin and yang. You know, like in the Greek mythology, you've got God of the white and the good, and then you've got the God of the hell. No. Satan, will, hell was created to punish Satan there. So Satan is not in hell, ruling and reigning with his pitchfork, sitting on a throne down there, sending his minions out. Right? That's not how hell works. Hell is a righteous judgment of God where unbelievers and sinners go to get punished. So this is why when you, people say things like, oh, you know, that, that's out of the pit of hell, or that demon's out of the pit of hell, that doesn't make sense. Because it's not like hell is a headquarters of all the demons and devils, right? Come, that's where they plan all their stuff and they're going to attack earth, right? Coming out, of, out, coming out of hell. So it doesn't work that way. They are equally fearful of going to hell. That's why when Jesus was walking and the ones possessed with devons, demons said, have thou come to torment us before the time? Because they know one day they're going to get sent to hell and they are fearful. That's why they believe that there is one God, but the devils also believe and tremble. Right? They are fearful of going there too. So the only one that can come out of hell, that has the keys of death and hell, is the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Because, because hell is like a prison, right? It's a place of torment. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Look at this. And have the keys of hell and of death. So that's why Jesus has the keys. That's why he was able to rise up out of hell. Right? And Jesus answered and said unto him, I'm trying to show you this, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter upon this rock. He's not talking about Peter here. He's talking about himself, right? Because Jesus is the rock. The truth that was revealed to Simon Peter, which was thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the rock. Upon this rock I will build my church. Look at this. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when you think about that, it's not that we are charging into hell to fight against hell's minions, right? It is that the gates of hell, because there are bars on hell and a lock, right? Like Jesus has the keys of death and of hell. And that's why hell could not prevail against him. He went into death and to hell and he rose again victorious, right? And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So not only does hell have keys, heaven has keys as well. But he's given them to the apostles, right? He's given them to us. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So this is referring to if we win somebody to Christ, right? Because ultimately Jesus is the key, right? Jesus is the key to heaven. If we give them that key, they can be bound in heaven, right? If we bind them on earth. So hell is the righteous judgment of God. It's not a headquarters for hell or, or, of demons and whatnot. What about Matthew 23? When he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, that's a convert, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So this is why people say, hey, so this is not the child of hell, meaning where they operate from hell. This means a child of hell, somebody going to hell, right? Twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So this is wicked people on the earth, not because they've been sent out of hell, it's because they are destined for hell. And we see here again the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. That is the key of death and of hell. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now this is where people think, ah, oh, look, hell's minions coming out, right? Like in, like in a computer game. They're coming out. They came out of the smoke, locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them they should, they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So notice how these creatures that are coming out of hell, they are not persecuting believers. They are coming out of hell and are told not to touch believers. So you notice how the creatures coming out of hell are come to torment unbelievers, not to torment believers. So just get that clear in your mind. Right? Demons and devils will one day be punished in hell. 
Right? This is why Satan one day will be cast into hell. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Look at this. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? So demons and devils are just ain't fallen angels, right? And creatures following Satan, they have sinned. They, they don't get a second chance like man does. And thank God we get a second chance. Right? God loved men. He took on the nature of men and gave us a second chance. Angels and heavenly creatures do not. That's why they're causing much havoc, right? Because that's all, that's all they've got left. Right? It's the hope that they can overthrow God. But God has prepared a place for them to be punished. They are roaming around on the earth. Satan does walk about seeking whom he may de devour. But they're not coming out from hell. Isaiah 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. So Satan was realistic enough to know that he could not replace God, but he wanted to be like God, didn't he? Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? What is he saying there? Well, when the people in hell see Satan also thrown down to hell, they're going to be like, man, how this great creature that ruled the earth, how has he now just become like one of us being tormented in hell? That's what he's saying there. So hell is God's righteous judgment. A couple of other misconceptions about hell. Hell is not separation from God. And I'm sure you've read it on a million tracks out there before. Yeah. To be eternally separated from God. Oh, like that's the, like that's the worst part about hell. Yeah. Like God, they, they don't want they, you get. It's like newsflash, sinners don't want anything to do with God. That's why they didn't accept Jesus Christ. They would love a place where God isn't. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? You know what makes hell so bad? It's because God is there. Yeah. Right? And you're in the presence of God as an unsaved person, right? Being punished. So hell is not separation from God. Hell is being punished in the very presence of God. And that's why hell is so bad. Let me show you a few verses there if you don't believe me. Psalm 139. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? This is David saying, where can I go to get away from God? Yeah. Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold. What does it mean? Look. Thou art there. God is in heaven. God is in hell. Revelation 14. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead and his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, look at this, and in the presence of the Lamb. Psalm 68, look at this, verse 2. As smoke is driven away... So drive them away, as wax melteth before the fire. So in the same way wax melts in the presence of fire, look at what it says here, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Second Thessalonians 1, the last one here, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is that? You obey the gospel, by believing the gospel, right? It's not a work salvation. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, some people read that and they read it as who shall be punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying you're going to be punished away from the presence of the Lord. It's the very presence of the Lord that is the everlasting destruction. Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And you can imagine that, right? If God is likened to light, 
I mean, when light is so intense like the sun, you can see how it burns as well as lightens. It's just the only reason why we can stand in the presence of God is because we have the righteousness of Christ. Amen. That's why we can stand there. And if you don't have that, that's what hell is, right? It is the fire that burns that does not consume. Like the burning bush, we burned and didn't consume. That's why the Bible says, Jesus says, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Because the fires burn, you can feel it, but it doesn't consume. Let's go on, two more. Number six, where is hell located? Hell is located in the center of the earth because when we read about hell, it's always down, right? Deuteronomy 32. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountain. Psalm 55. Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Ezekiel 31. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. Matthew 11, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which should have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. So believe it or not, that's where hell is right now. It's beneath our feet, beneath everyone's feet, right? in the center of the earth. Now what I find, you know what people say things like, oh, you know, you really believe, they'll say something like, you really believe hell is in the center of the earth? Like literally, like if you were to drill down? Because you know, people have not, when, when you think about people drilling down deep into the earth, I mean, they are not getting through the crust. And the crust, you know, they say like when you look at an apple, the crust is thinner than the skin on the apple, right? But that's how deep it is. That, they don't know what's in the earth. I don't know what's down there, but we know what's down there. Hell is in there. And is it so hard to believe that hell is in the center of the earth when day after day, somewhere, in the, somewhere on the earth, you know what is spewing out of volcanoes? Hot, molten rock and lava. And people think, you really think hell is down? I don't know what's down there. I mean, I know what's down there. Whatever is down there is really hot. Right? Because that's what... Is coming out of the earth. So it's not so crazy to think, you really think a place of fire is in the middle of the earth? Yes. And I think there is ample scientific evidence of that too. So that's where hell is. You know, that's why it's hot down there. You know? And um, unfortunately, that's where people will spend eternity if they do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Last point, quick one. Because people ask, well... If hell is in the center of the earth, but we read about, like in Revelation 20 here, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You hear about outer darkness, right? Because one day, hell is going to be relocated. Because what, right now, hell is beneath our feet in the center of the earth. It's down. But at the great white throne judgment, hell is going to be relocated somewhere else into outer darkness. Right? Because on the new heaven and new earth and, and through this time, it's not going to be beneath us. It's going to be somewhere else in outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So people sometimes wonder, do people who are not saved, do they spend an eternity in hell? Or are they spending an eternity in the lake of fire? Like, which one is it? Is there two places? And how does that work? So the way I understand it is, here is the point where death and hell is like located. Imagine if like you were in a prison, right? And let's say that prison was located to another country. It's like that. Hell, the place itself, is located to outer darkness. And at this white throne judgment, people are cast into the lake of fire where hell now is. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, it's not wrong to say people spend an eternity in hell. Because the lake of fire is also called hell. Because when you die today and your soul descends into hell as an unbeliever, right, your body is on the ground. Your body 
is not thrown into hell. Right? Your body, we bury the body, but the person who is not saved, their soul descends into hell like the rich man. You know, they open their eyes and they're burning in hell consciously, but their body is not there. But look at what the Bible says in Matthew 10. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able, look, to destroy both soul and body in hell. But see, the body gets destroyed when it's cast into the lake of fire, right? Once it's thrown into outer darkness. And notice that Jesus still calls that place hell. So it's not wrong to say people will spend an eternity in hell, but obviously the nuanced understanding of that is you have a location in the center of the earth, which is down, and then you have the lake of fire, outer darkness, which at the white throne judgment, hell will be relocated there. And when people are reunited with their body, and they will be thrown into the lake of fire. I'll skip over Matthew 5 for sake of time. Okay, so I hope you learned a bit about hell this morning. That's the truth about hell is real. Hell is an eternal punishment. Eternity of hell is a just punishment. Hell is God's righteous judgment, not Satan's headquarters. Hell is in God's presence, not separation from God. Hell is located in the center of the earth. And then number seven is one day hell will be relocated to the lake of fire. So a hot day today, a good day to reflect on the heat of hell. You know, I don't know if the sermon made it a little bit hotter in here today. But what I want you guys to think about and take away from this sermon, it's always great to learn a little bit about doctrine, learn a bit about hell. But what I want you to think about, and what I want the last thought to be is, do you really believe hell is real? Do you really believe it exists? Because I think if you truly believed it was real and it existed, you would have the same mindset as the rich man that went to hell. To think, man, I don't want anybody else to come here. And that's why we've got to get soul winning, guys. That's why we have to preach the gospel. We have to get out there and tell people about Jesus Christ because that's the only way that's going to stop them from going to that place. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder, Lord. Um, you know, we can think about the heat on today. It's coming from the, the sun. It's coming from, and you know, you are a picture of the sun, Lord, and people who are burning in hell and experiencing that terrible place are going to be in your presence for all eternity. Lord, help us to be concerned about the souls of people as you are. Help us to go out there, preach the gospel to them, change their mind, Lord. Help them to repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, Lord. Help us whether cold, whether hot, that we will be consistent in season, out of season, preaching the gospel to the lost. Help us to grow in our knowledge and our wisdom so that we can be more effective reaching people. Help us, Lord, because we need your grace. We, are, you know, we fail you every day, but Lord, we know we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. And we pray these things in his precious name. Amen.